Dear colleagues, welcome to today's ESCBI seminar, a webinar on how to use contrast to rule out left atrial appendage thrombus during transesophageal echocardiography. I'm Professor Roxy Senior from the Royal Brompton Hospital, London, UK, and I have the pleasure of uh, being accompanied by Dr. Andreas Helfen, uh, who's from St. Marian Hospital, Köln, Germany. The aim of the webinar is to give you a better understanding of the clinical uh, use of contrast echocardiography for the differential diagnosis of the left atrial appendage thrombus versus normal variants of the left atrial appendage and spontaneous echo contrast in patients who are scheduled to undergo cardioversion, uh, ablation therapy, or percutaneous left atrial appendage closure. It is also to learn the advantages, safety, and pitfalls of contrast transesophageal echocardiography to reliably rule out left atrial appendage thrombus. These will be highlighted through case presentations. Uh, the session is interactive, and we strongly encourage you to actively participate by sending your questions and comments at any time during the webinar throughout the chat. For the best uh, learning experience, we also would like you to participate in the MCQ that will be posted during the webinar. The program is supported by BRACO, by BRACO Educational Grant, and I will now hand over to Dr. Helfen for the presentation. Thank you very much. It's all yours now. Yeah. <clears throat> Dear colleagues, <clears throat> the use of ultrasound contrast agents is well established to rule out a left ventricular thrombus with transthoracic echo, but it is also indispensable when we intend to rule out a thrombus uh, in the left atrial appendage. I want to focus in my presentation uh, primarily on the practical aspects of this method. That means uh, what should we consider to, uh, when we optimize um, the setup of our echo machine? How can we minimize uh, imaging artifacts? In which situation is it especially helpful to use contrast and in which situation is it not? And finally, I want to present uh, about 16 different thrombi so that you will have a good idea how a thrombus looks like with contrast enhanced imaging at the end of this webinar. Um, these are my disclosures <clears throat> and I want to start uh, with a clinical case. Um, this patient um, was planned for a cardioversion and um, this is a quite familiar situation. You can see here a small structure uh, at the tip of the left atrial appendage and um, I want to ask you uh, which statement suits best. Is it A, a thrombus and a cardioversion should be deferred, or is it B, this is a pectinate musculature and cardioversion is possible, or C, you need additional imaging information, maybe 3D or contrast, please vote. So you've got 30 seconds to <coughs> vote. Uh, so while they vote, Andreas, uh, uh, let's find out about in your practice, uh, how many, you know, what is the percentage of time where you're not sure whether there's a thrombus in the left atrial appendage? Yeah, um, I think um, in one of 10 patients, uh, I'm really not sure. Uh, and um, I use contrast to exclude a thrombus. Yeah. Okay, so it's about 10% in your practice that you need to do additional imaging like yeah. contrast. So I think they're pretty quick in answering this <coughs> question, actually. Mm -hmm. So majority have said they need additional imaging in the form of 3D or contrast. Yeah, I think this is always right. <laughs> and um, let's have a look first uh, on the definition. And uh, the pectinate musculature is defined that uh, echogenicity and mobility do not, is not different from the myocardium of the surrounding left atrial appendage, where the thrombus is a formed mass, different uh, in according to echogenicity and mobility. And uh, if we go back to our example, then we can see that uh, the echogenicity of this structure is the uh, same like the surrounding uh, myocardium and the movement 
is um, in synchrony with uh, the surrounding myocardium. So I think this is a trabeculation and not a thrombus. Of course, uh, we can use uh, additional imaging information, but before I show you the 3D data, I show you uh, for comparison uh, a thrombus in the left atrial appendage, and you can see here the movement is different and the echogenicity is a little bit lower than the surrounding myocardium. So this is a thrombus. And let's go back to our example. Um, this is a 3D data set from this patient. And this structure here, this is a, um, a pectinate musculature. So we can use 3D to, uh, uh, to make this diagnosis certain. So, so in other words, <coughs> the, the contrast actually what we saw was there was no echo-free space. Yeah. There was this uh, you know, echogenic structure still. So that cannot be a thrombus anyway. So that has to be part of the musculature as you yeah. described. And here 3D was very helpful in bringing that out. Exactly. Yeah. So um, 3D is really helpful to understand the complex anatomy and how the pectinate musculature forms these recesses. And uh, sometimes we are able to detect with 3D uh, those thrombi here. And you can see this is free, this uh, recesses, and these both are filled with a small thrombus. But a 3D is limited by uh, spatial resolution, by resolution in time, and especially in case of a high heart rate, like in this case. Um, I think 3D is not helpful if we have a patient with a spontaneous echo contrast here, abbreviated with SEC. As you can see here, uh, the, the spontaneous echo contrast is rendered as a more or less uh, solid structure and we can't dis uh, dif um, differentiate if this is a thrombus or only a spontaneous echo contrast. So um, what do the guidelines recommend um, for stroke prevention in patients uh, designated for a cardioversion? Um, there are two pathways. The traditional one is that uh, we subscribe an effective anticoagulation for at least three weeks. And um, the second one is uh, when we plan an early cardioversion that we perform a transesophageal echocardiography, exclude the thrombus, and then perform uh, the cardioversion. And uh, in case that a thrombus is identified on TEE, uh, we switch back to the first pathway and uh, uh, subscribe an effective anticoagulation for at least three weeks. And um, there is a recommendation that we repeat the transesophageal echo after this time and uh, to ensure that the thrombus has completely resolved. Uh, so, so, Andreas, in, in your practice, I mean, it's a class 2A indication yeah. that you repeat the uh, TOE, but it's not class 1. So, in other words, you may not do it uh, and do the cardioversion because three weeks of anticoagulation actually does will do. Yeah. So, but in your practice, you, we, you would we, like to do we, it, We right? uh, work according to this recommendation. Mm. Um, but uh, if you look into the guideline, uh, this recommendation, there is no study quoted. Mm. <laughs> so this is uh, a pure uh, clinical, expert combu uh, That's uh, right, clinical view of yeah. what you should be okay. doing. Okay. So, um, there are potential mechanisms uh, for embolic events, and uh, two, um, uh, there are two uh, factors uh, with uh, some evidence. Uh, the, one is, uh, the first one is uh, that we um, find a thrombus in the left atrial uh, appendage, and then there is ejection of the thrombus after restoration of the mechanical function. And uh, the other one is uh, that after cardioversion, there is uh, an electromechanical stunning. Uh, the left atrial appendage don't move, uh, doesn't move. Uh, the velocities are very low. There appears spontaneous echo contrast, and uh, a thrombus is formed de novo. Uh, but these both mechanisms do not fully explain observations made in clinical practice, like in this one published this year. These are data from the active trial. And uh, in this trial, uh, among 11,000 patients, about 1,000 had a cardioversion with a high success rate. And only 30% are treated according to the guidelines with an oral anticoagulation for more than three weeks or uh, a TEE examination. And the majority was treated not according to the guidelines with a shorter anticoagulation or even with aspirin or aspirin plus clopidogrel. 
And what was the observation in this study was that not only after cardioversion there was an increased risk for cardioembolic events, this is a 30 day period, but in, uh, there was an increased risk before cardioversion. And this was only true in patients hospitalized for heart failure and atrial fibrillation, this is this group, and this was not observed in the group of patients without heart failure who um, undergone their cardioversion outside the hospital. So obviously heart failure plays a role and the authors uh, concluded in their study uh, that the risk for an embolic event was uh, uh, higher uh, whether or not cardioversion was successful, which uh, effect that is really surprising, and uh, whether or not uh, oral anticoagulation or a TEE were used prior to cardioversion. And uh, the temporal pattern suggests that part of the risk associated with cardioversion is not causal. And um, this leads us to uh, a new a model that we believe that there is a, a sort of atrial myopathy. There is an insult by aging, atrial stretching, inflammation, and um, this uh, generates two pathways. There is a fibrosis and electrophysiological remodeling that leads to atrial fibrillation, and there is on the other hand um, an endothelial dysfunction, fibrosis and a stasis. And the, follow, uh, the consequence of this is that there is a prothrombotic state. This is uh, modified by lots of factors like wall motion abnormalities, the activation of platelets, there is uh, inflammation, endothelial damage. And um, this, uh, on the other hand, influences the occurrence of atrial fibrillation. So, uh, Andreas, going back to the slide where you showed thrombosis actually leads to atrial fibrillation, but uh, that's not exactly what it means, does it? No, it is more or less an indicator that the risk is higher in patients with this prothrombotic state that they develop uh, atrial fibrillation. And um, inflammation is a known factor mm. for atrial fibrillation as well. So um, does morphology plays a role as a risk factor? We can describe uh, a chicken wing form with an angulation of less than 100 degrees if we choose a scan plane of 110 to 140 degrees. In this scan plane, the left upper uh, pulmonary vein is displayed in a long axis view. And uh, we can um, describe a non-chicken form. It is uh, divided in Windsor cactus and cauliflowers. It is not really important for the echocardiographer's view. Uh, but in this study um, uh, by Beigel and Wunderlich, they described in only in patients with a low uh, chest score of zero point or one point um, that uh, the uh, chicken wing morphology was associated with a uh, much lower risk um, than uh, the non-chicken wing forms. Uh, and uh, in the group of patients with a higher risk score, this difference reached no longer statistical significance. So in this group, maybe the dilatation of the left atrium or the left atrial appendage plays a much bigger role than morphology. Uh, so what, would, what is, in your opinion, what is the clinical implication of, uh, of actually knowing the morphology uh, of the left atrial appendage? In other words, what you just described is that the windsock cactus and cauliflower-like morphology results in higher risk of thromboembolism uh, in, in, a, in a patient with a chance risk score of only 0 to 1. So, but does it have any clinical Im implication, do you think? In other words, if a patient has got a CHADS risk uh, score of zero, CHADS risk score of zero, mm. and y you happen to identify those morphology, would you be inclined to give anticoagulation? No, um, we have to look carefully for a thrombus, mm. um, and we keep in mind that this is associated with a higher risk, but this is not a reason to uh, start with an anticoagulation. This okay. study deals with patient um, planned for catheter ablation. Uh, in this study uh, are patients included with a persistent or uh, chronic uh, atrial fibrillation, so uh, this describes only uh, a higher risk.
Thank okay, you. let's uh, proceed. Uh, what is the indication for the use of contrast agents to, according to the guidelines? Professor Senior is the chair of the EICBI guidelines, and in this guideline is recommended uh, that we use contrast or we we uh, may use contrast when the native images are inconclusive for the diagnosis of left atrial uh, appendage thrombus. And um, this is quite the same recommendation by the American guidelines. Uh, uh, they point out that uh, especially a significant spontaneous echo contrast may, um, may be a factor that uh, um, uh, let us think about the use of contrast even more. So. Um, um, let's go to a checklist uh, of imaging acquisition. Uh, first of all, uh, if we look at the left atrial appendage, I recommend to use uh, for the native images harmonic imaging. We have less artifacts and um, uh, if we use uh, contrast, then uh, we may use uh, harmonic imaging, but we have to reduce the output power of the probe. Uh, this is the same as if we look at the left ventricle to rule out there a thrombus, uh, and we have to adjust the focus position. This is again the same like with the left ventricle. Um, uh, it is a, a good idea to position the focus at the tip of the left atrial appendage. And if available on the echo machine, uh, we can use um, a, a tissue signal cancellation. And I want to show you an example for this. Um, on the left side, you see here uh, a, a huge thrombus with a bright harmonic signal in the native uh, images. Of course, we do not need contrast. And now um, I show you the contrast enhanced images. And uh, this is what we expect from a good contrast image, uh, that uh, the thrombus is uh, free of contrast, is a filling defect, and that uh, there is no um, underlying um, tissue second harmonic imaging signal. So we have a really good um, uh, signal noise ratio. And um, on the right side, this is harmonic imaging. I have only reduced the output power and adapted the focus. And you can see here, there is still um, um, a tissue harmonic signal. So the uh, signal noise ratio between the contrast in the left atrium and the signal of the thrombus, uh, the, the signal noise ratio is low. And so it is a little bit more difficult uh, to use uh, this technique to identify a thrombus. And also, just to uh, uh, remain on these images, you, you, uh, multiple imaging obviously looks uh, very, uh, 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 very high resolution. I mean, you can yeah. see the contrast very well. It's uniformly opacified, whereas on the harmonic imaging, it doesn't appear that uniformly uh, uh, opacified. Is it because you are using a higher frequency in the harmonic imaging, and with a higher frequency, your penetration is not that good, and therefore you're not actually seeing the full effect of the contrast lower down in the deeper part of the tissue yeah. uh, compared to your multipulse imaging. Exactly. Uh, the multipulse imaging is, uh, we have uh, one frequency, it's uh, 2.5 slash 5, 0 which megahertz, is low, which is lower than the harmonic imaging. This is, uh, in this case, uh, 3.0 slash uh, 6.0 megahertz. So we have less penetration. Yes. And uh, obviously, uh, um, uh, not, uh, not as good uh, uh, resolution um, between... Uh, as a multipulse one should be. Yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah, that's right. So um, I want to show you this uh, with another example because this is an important point, yes. how we acquire images. Um, on the left side, you see here there is a left atrial appendage and there is a mobile structure. And um, maybe this, uh, this structure is uh, not um, positioned within the left atrial appendage, but within the pericardial space. And if we inject contrast, you can see here that there is obviously a complete filling of the left atrial appendage, but the structure is not uh, uh, um, displayed because the underlying uh, f uh, tissue harmonic signals are nicely suppressed or cancelled out. And uh, of course, there is no signal from the pericardial effusion. And now if we shift um, to the harmonic imaging, you can see here that uh, the um, 
tissue harmonic signal is as bright and quite the same like the contrast signal from the left atrial appendage. Mm. So if this structure would be located within the left atrial appendage, it would be maybe impossible to, to diagnose this, this thrombus or this structure. So um, I think uh, if, you, if the multipulse technique is available, uh, I would always prefer this technique and not the harmonic imaging technique. Uh, this is another example. Uh, in this case, uh, there is a hyperechoic thrombus here at the tip of the left atrial appendage. And uh, with this technique, we can uh, nicely demonstrate the thrombus. Maybe here is an additional one. And I think uh, with the harmonic technique um, here in, in, uh, in, in the depth of 10 centimeters, it will be very difficult to get a good signal noise ratio to clearly um, delineate the thrombus and discri discriminate it from the surrounding contrast. And, and the other thing to note, I think this is a very important uh, image that we're showing, that uh, echo, uh, that, that uh, a thrombi or thrombus uh, doesn't take up contrast. Y yes. Right? Because it is an avascular structure. And, and therefore, when you use uh, contrast, you see it as an echo, you know, a, a contrast-free space. Uh, while if it's not a thrombus, if it's part of other structure, then you will actually see the, uh, you will not see it as an echo-free space. So echo-free, uh, the contrast-free space is actually pathognomic of a thrombus in that area, in that particular uh, With, uh, within the, the left yes. atrial within appendage, the left atrial appendage yes. exactly. Uh, but of course, there is a contrast-free zone here, yes. and this is a pericardial space. Yeah. This, so, so yeah. So, so that's in within the limits. But inside the left atrial yeah. appendage, yeah, that's exactly. Where you see, yeah. Um, let's uh, go further through this checklist. Uh, of course, we have to check uh, our venous line, and I recommend a right antecubital vein for this purpose. And uh, we. Uh, take care that um, uh, the venous line uh, can be flushed uh, very easily without any pressure uh, because um, we, want to, we do not want to destroy part of the contrast agent with pressure. So we inject uh, 20 milliliters of saline and uh, um, then we acquire a baseline image. Um, I think this is important. Uh, because uh, you get an idea of uh, the um, harmonic uh, tissue signals and we compare this image then later on with a contrast filled image and now we can decide which is part of uh, the myocardium and which is a truly uh, a contrast signal. Um, for contrast agent, you can use every contrast agent of, uh, approved in the market. Uh, in our Echolab, we use uh, Sonovu and uh, we use a bolus of 0.5 up to 0.7 milliliters and we flush this bolus with 5 milliliters saline. And uh, the next step is um, that we have to optimize the image quality, um, especially um, important is uh, that we avoid overdosing and underdosing. Whereas if you have found once uh, a setup that works for you, you normally do not have to uh, adjust uh, the mechanical index because you can use uh, this for nearly all of the examinations. And I want to show you an example. Uh, so just before you show okay. the example, I think uh, again you stated a very important point here that uh, first of all, when you actually inject the contrast, you should be using the right size needle uh, anticubital vein because you want the whole of the contrast to go through. And you made your point again clearly that you are using a higher dose of contrast compared to if you are doing a transthoracic echo uh, uh, with, the, with the LVO mode. Though in both cases, you are reducing the mechanical index to 0 0.1 level. So here, probably you need more because even though it says 0 0.1, actually the mechanical index is higher here because it's near the, uh, your probe. And therefore, exactly. you're using higher uh, 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 contrast here. There is more bubble destruction. More bubble destruction. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, a normal uh, mechanical index is 0 0.4 yes. for a transesophageal uh, study. And if we use 0 0.1, yeah. it's not the same as with transthoracic echo, where we normally use 1.2 yes. uh, as a mechanical index for yes. non-contrast enhanced images. 
So uh, let's uh, proceed with um, uh, the dosage. And this is a really important point. Um, it is the same uh, we know from the left ventricle. If we inject contrast, there is, uh, with a bolus technique, there is at first an overdosing and there is shadowing. We know this phenomenon very well from the left ventricle. And after a short period, maybe 10 to 20 seconds, then our diagnostic window opens. We have a really good um, um, delineation of the borders of the left atrium. We can see the filling defect of the left thrombus. And then uh, after maybe 20 seconds, uh, the contrast agent is diluted and uh, the signal noise ratio decreases and we have to re-inject an additional dose. Um, and for this I want to show you an image. Um, this is a patient with a dilated left atrial appendage with a spontaneous echo contrast. And this is uh, very early after the contrast filled uh, the left atrium. And uh, you can see here that we have a bright signal near the probe, uh, nearly no, uh, almost no swirling. And this here is a shadowing phenomenon and if we wait, maybe 10 seconds, this is the same recording, then um, the shadowing disappears and we can delineate uh, even uh, the tip of the left atrial appendage and exclude a thrombus. So again, this is a, a very important, uh, 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 these images are very important to understand that though we are saying that uh, thrombus is echo-free. I mean, if you just stop at the shadowing level, you might call that a big thrombus sitting there, right? On, on in the in the sh in the uh, yeah where, where you have overdosed, and it is important to distinguish this from shadowing, because then you wait and see uh, you know for the contrast to become less, in order to opacify the left atrial appendage better, in order for you to make a diagnosis. Exactly. So. Uh this uh, draws uh, me to the conclusion we need a long um, loop uh, and we have to wait yes. before we uh, stop too early yes. and uh, we see a filling defect and yes. we do not really is it uh, no it is an attenuation phenomenon or a filling defect. Yes. So uh, this is an example of an underdosing. Uh, on the left side this is a, here is a thrombus within the left atrial appendage and on the right side um, there is only um, uh, a weak signal, there is a mobile structure, uh, but uh, the contrast uh, filling is uh, not really good and the signal noise ratio is really bad. So in this situation we have to re-inject an additional bolus and we use the same dosage, uh, not a reduced dosage, to uh, fill again. Uh, the left atrial appendage. And, and this is a multipulse technique? Again. This is a multipulse yeah. technique. And, and, and you've seen and you've shown the images before that with multipulse technique it should be more dense, more uniform. Yes. And therefore that, that just looking at the image you can say that it is, uh, the patient is underdosed. You need more, more exactly. uh, micro bubbles there. Yeah. So uh, this is my last point of the checklist of image acquisition. Uh, I recommend uh, to uh, uh, acquire um, at least three to five loops after complete filling of the atrial, left atrial appendage. And um, if we start the examination, then we um, uh, consider to, uh, to acquire a very long loop. This uh, is, um, um, depends uh, from the filling velocity. If the filling velocities are very low, uh, these long loops are required uh, to exclude a thrombus. And I want to show you an example for this. Uh, here again, this is a zoom of the left atrial appendage. Now the contrast agent fills uh, the left atrial appendage and you can see here how long it lasts. Even now we are about uh, 50, 50 seconds and uh, there is still a filling defect here in the left atrial appendage and we have to wait and sometimes we have to even re-inject a second bolus because there is not a complete filling of the left atrial appendage. But at the end, and I show you here the timeline, there is a complete filling and we can exclude a thrombus in this situation. On the other hand, um, this is an example of a thrombus in the left atrial appendage. Again here with a grayscale image, this is really difficult to delineate here a thrombus. Uh, 
here is some sort of spontaneous echo contrast and if we now uh, inject the contrast agent and we have to wait again this is a filling uh, we normally use a biplane image uh, for this reason and um, it lasts uh, now 20 seconds and there is a filling defect we have to wait we have to wait we have to wait and even after 36 seconds there is still a filling defect and um, we injected another one and the filling defect persisted uh, so we have been sure that this was a filling defect uh, sometimes um, um, my colleagues argue with me uh, is this maybe an attenuation artifact um, and this is uh, for this uh, thing I, I think you need a little bit experience I show you another example and this left atrial appendage is formed um, uh, quite similar to this one uh, and you can see here there is a complete filling, there is no attenuation artifact, so if you perform lots of contrast studies you learn that um, there are uh, almost no attenuation artifacts, especially with this multipulse technique, yes. of course. This is uh, a prerequisite in this situation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with atten attenuation artifact, of course, you will see a much dense contrast above that uh, attenuation field rather than what you're showing now, which looks more uniform. Mm, yes. So that also could suggest that it's not an attenuation artifact, but a thrombus in your yeah. previous case, and, yes. And if you look, look very carefully yes. here on the grayscale yes. image, you may even anticipate that there is uh, yes. uh, a, a hypo, high. hypoechogenic yeah. thrombus, maybe. Yeah. So um, sometimes uh, we have to deal with reverberation artifacts. Uh, and in this case, I think we do not really use uh, contrast to exclude this, this structure here is a reverberation artifact. But I want to show you with this example how you can use in these situations contrast because in this, uh, uh, this is uh, for educational purpose very simple example because here this is a structure uh, and the distance from the probe to the uh, limbus of the left upper pulmonary vein is the same distance uh, to, from the limbus to this artifact, so this is obviously or most likely a reverberation artifact. And if we use 3D, then there is obviously no contact to the wall of the left atrial appendage. But let's have a look how contrast works in this situation. And we use the multipulse technique. And uh, you see here, there is a very fast filling of the left atrial appendage. Uh, it fills with the same velocity like the left ventricle. Uh, when it starts again, look here, uh, this is the left ventricle and the left atrial appendage fills with the same velocity. And here is um, no artifact, so no filling defect. And again, let's compare this uh, to the harmonic imaging. Um, there is still an artifact here. Uh, so again, I think uh, the harmonic imaging technique is not so uh, suitable as a multi multipulse technique. Yeah, absolutely. So those, the, 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 the reverberation artifact actually also, you know, produces, the harmonics actually produce a lot of reverber reverberation artifacts also. Yeah. And therefore, with multipulse technique, you suppress the tissue harmonic completely and therefore you get rid of that. Um, this is uh, maybe not only a reverberation artifact, but a shadowing artifact. And you see, this is a not diagnostic study. We can't really, um, mm. we have no clue if there is a thrombus behind this artifact. Mm. But if we inject contrast, although there is still some sort of artifact, we have a diagnostic study. So this is a good example that we increase our sensitivity and gain more certainty to exclude a thrombus with the use of contrast. Um, spontaneous echo contrast, I think, is our worst enemy uh, with transthoracic echo, uh, with transesophageal echo. Um, it is normally uh, defined as a swirling echo, like smoke, and we find it in areas with reduced flow velocity. So um, uh, um, it, the, the signal intensity depends from the frequency of our probe. And um, 
Uh, we, uh, with contrast, we observe a prolonged filling time, but uh, we can exclude a thrombus because there is no persisting filling defect and we can proceed with a uh, cardioversion. And I want to show you what is the influence of uh, the probe uh, frequency. This is uh, a recording with uh, 8 megahertz. There is uh, a little bit of contrast, uh, spontaneous echo contrast. And uh, if we switch over to harmonic imaging, uh, then the spontaneous echo contrast is more prominent. And um, um, in this case, here there is a very dense spontaneous echo contrast. You can't clearly delineate a thrombus here, but with contrast, it is very easy to uh, see that in the tip there is a pericardial effusion, then this area, this is a thrombus, and above this area, this is spontaneous echo contrast filled with a contrast agent. So we can clearly delineate the thrombus with contrast and um, have an additional imaging information. This is uh, uh, valuable for follow-up examinations, for example. Uh, so just uh, uh, coming back to this point, which is again an important point that one should know, that uh, with, funda with fundamental imaging, you don't see the echo contrast that well. But with harmonic imaging, you see it better. Exactly. So, but, but the importance of echo contrast is that's a precursor of a thrombus. Yeah. So then you should now be alert to look for thrombus. So it's best to actually do the imaging in harmonic mode to start off with, like you said, exactly. rather than fundamental imaging, to identify the precursors of thrombus and then you can uh, do more imaging. And to look more, more, carefully more carefully in every corner of the left atrium. That's correct. Exactly. <laughs> So um, this is my next uh, multiple choice question for our audience. Um, um, please uh, vote which statement suits best. Is it A, this structure here in the, left, uh, the tip of the left atrial appendage is a thrombus and a cardioversion should be deferred. You see here uh, there is some inhomogeneous uh, signal here, a little bit hypoechogenic and hyperechogenic but there are no swirling echoes, right? Or is it B, and this is definitely not a thrombus, but spontaneous echo contrast and cardioversion is possible without contrast? And uh, the last uh, possibility is, uh, do you need additional imaging information like contrast? Please vote. Okay, you have 30 seconds to do so. So while they are uh, racking their brains about it, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so let me ask you this question, um, Andreas. That uh, in 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 your practice, um, do you you know is there a particular probe um, um, uh, anatomy that you would like to you actually uh, 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 for imaging left atrial appendage properly? Is there a particular landmark that you want to use to say, okay, this is the place that I see the left atrial appendage the best, or you actually do the full examination of the left atrial appendage from whatever angle you get. Yeah, uh, I, st I strongly recommend to look at every angle uh, possible. We perform uh, these studies normally by, uh, simultaneously by plane. And then we move the probe with uh, 50 degrees, 15 degrees steps. Uh, so, for example, we start with zero and 90 degrees and then 15 to 105, 30 to 120 and so on, so that we have uh, a good idea of uh, every scanned plane in the end. So it is necessary to scan it very carefully. Okay, great. So now uh, we've got the ans uh, answer here yeah. now. So um, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> <laughs> it's a contrast session, yeah. so the, everybody said contrast should be used. But what is important here is, yeah. it is quite possible that if we had not discussed about it, many people would have said, okay, you know, it's quite clearly a thrombus, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't proceed, uh, or, or it's not a thrombus. They yeah. would not talk about contrast. So <laughs> at least people are thinking about contrast here. So that's a great answer. Yeah, okay. Before, uh, before I give you the contrast yes. images, uh, I want to show you a study uh, which focuses exactly on this problem uh, published this year. Uh, and uh, this uh, study uh, um, examines uh, the interpretive confidence. And uh, in this study, four cardiologists, experienced cardiologists, asked uh, to analyze uh, 
a set of non-contrast images and not enhanced contrast images and contrast enhanced images. And uh, they have to vote if uh, they would proceed with a cardio version or not. Mm -hmm. That means, are, are you certain there is or there is no mm -hmm. thrombus and this, uh, both this decision with and without contrast. And the result was, is uh, if the native images were less than certain, then with contrast, the absolute number of cardio versions increased by uh, 16% and uh, in the case of spontaneous echo contrast by 21% and uh, in the combination by 29%. So obviously the inter-reader confidence uh, increases when we use contrast, especially in the case of spontaneous echo contrast. Mm. And otherwise, if there is a certain diagnosis, a very good imaging quality, and there is no spontaneous echo contrast, there is no additional information in the use of contrast, uh, otherwise, we have to deal with artifacts, so you may be less sure after you inject contrast. So this is uh, clearly the domain of 3D mm -hmm. and not for contrast, in my opinion. And I want to show you uh, the images, and you can see here that there is a complete filling of the left atrial appendage, so it is kind of an atypical spontaneous echo contrast. And, uh, and uh, answer C, I need additional imaging information, is uh, the answer, answer I prefer in this situation. So um, I want to show you uh, even an example of a very small thrombus. Here is spherical thrombus at the tip. Um, uh, and um, uh, I want to show you now uh, three different difficult situations or different situations when we use or not use contrast, in this, this situation, I almost never use contrast. I show this for, for educational purposes. This is clearly, uh, 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 the, here is a thrombus and here is a thrombus. And um, in this case, when we inject contrast, we use it for follow-up uh, uh, examinations mm -hmm. to document that the size of the thrombus has resolved. Um, then uh, we have the special case of a pouch thrombus. Uh, a pouch is an incomplete fusion of the septum primum and the septum secundum. And there is a recessus formed by this incomplete fusion. And um, sometimes, especially in the case of a worsening heart failure, there is um, a thrombus within. Uh, uh, this is a dark line here. There is a thrombus within this pouch and there is um, attached to this a spherical thrombus in a patient with a worsening heart failure. And I'll show you another example. Um, uh, this is um, a patient with a thrombus. Um, yeah, is it uh, a pouch thrombus or is it thrombus in, in transit? I think uh, to, to answer this question, um, you have to look at the right side of the, right, uh, uh, of the septum and if you can um, diagnose here a part of the thrombus, is, it is most probably um, a, a thrombus in transit. And if there is no thrombus, it is probably a pouch thrombus. So in both cases, I would recommend to uh, prescribe an oral anticoagulation and to repeat the examination again. Well, I think in, you know, in, in one of the cases where you think it's a transit thrombus, uh, I would be very worried about the transit thrombus because it's going to go through and the patient will have a stroke. So I will bring the patient in and start the patient on, you know, uh, uh, intravenous heparin to uh, abort that. Uh, I think that's a very good way of distinguishing between a thrombus uh, which is in transit and therefore likely to cause and the other one is on the other side in the pouch. You and we only can just give oral anticoagulation. Exactly. So I think it's a very important use of contrast in terms of urgency of ant anticoagulation. So um, this uh, I, I call a, a spout thrombus is a concave filling defect. And this uh, situation is most often associated with spontaneous echo contrast. And in this situation, I almost always use contrast uh, because um, um, it is important for follow-up examinations. Um, 
in this case here, this is a, f a first examination. There is a, con a filling defect, a, 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 a dense spontaneous echo contrast maybe, and in the follow-up examination it is maybe the same, uh, but if you compare the contrast uh, f uh, uh, images, there is obviously um, a, a par a partly resolution of the thrombus. Mm. In this case, we proceeded uh, with two months more uh, oral anticoagulation, and in the end, the thrombus completely resolved, and we performed the cardio version. So, um, uh, in case of an LLA occluder, after uh, the procedure for the four or six weeks follow-up, we normally do not use any contrast. Uh, the occluder has a plain and even surface and it is um, normally very easy to detect these mobile thrombus and especially in the next case where here is a, a big thrombus attached uh, to the device. Uh, for LLA occluder we rarely use contrast and most often uh, to, um, to amplify uh, color flow signals if we are not really sure if there is a liquid leakage uh, at the border of the occluder or not. So I so want just before you yeah. conclude, I think this is a very good uh, uh, example of where you would not use contrast, where it is not very helpful, but at the same time, you would still use contrast if you are worried there could be some leak around the occluder then you would be yeah. to, to be absolutely sure you, so here the indication for using it is not to identify thrombus but to actually identify the leak if it is not so, possible yeah. with color doppler absolutely if it's not possible with color so it's a it's a wide use of contrast actually for left atrial appendage examination yes so uh i conclude um, according to the concept of atrial myopathy, not only atrial fibrillation but on, also a prothrombotic state leads to the formation of a thrombus and atrial fibrillation may in this case serve more as a marker of a prothrombotic state, especially if the episodes are very short. And ultrasound contrast agents are uh, indicated to rule out a thrombus in the case that uh, the non-enhanced contrast images are inconclusive and especially if uh, we are uh, confronted with a significant spontaneous echo contrast. Um, if you check your settings, uh, you should use um, harmonic imaging or preferable multipulse technique if available. Uh, you should reduce uh, mechanical index uh, to uh, 0.02 or 0.07 to 0.2 and you have to adjust the focus position near the tip of the left atrial appendage and um, you should consider a long loop uh, to, to document the filling uh, time of the uh, left atrial appendage especially when there are Re highly reduced emptying velocities and of course we have to optimize the dosage uh, to avoid uh, filling defects uh, by overdosing for example. Thank you very much Andreas that was a great coverage of the topic uh, but we've got uh, about 11 minutes okay. but I think we've got eight minutes to answer the questions and um, there are plenty of questions now and let's see uh, what we have here. So um, now, there's an interesting question about right atrial appendage thrombus. Yeah. What, what would you say about uh, that? First of all, uh, right atrial appendage are ri uh, really rare. Mm -hmm. um, the second point is uh, there is the interatrial septum in between. And uh, this is very far distance from uh, the probe. So uh, I recommend first uh, a higher MI to mm -hmm. penetrate. Mm -hmm. uh, never mind the bubble destruction in the near field. And uh, there is a special trick. Mm -hmm. um, um, when the contrast um, has not uh, reached the left atrial appendage, this is the best situation. Mm -hmm. the, the right atrium is still filled, yes. but the left atrium not filled. Yeah. Then you have less attenuation and it is easier to detect a thrombus. And this is especially true if you re-inject a second dose. Uh, norm, um, um, uh, yeah, I think uh, this is true also for thrombi in the vena cava superior when you deal with an infected yes. uh, 
uh, catheter yes. or something like yes. this, yes. or even an electrode of a pacemaker. Okay, great. So let's look at some other questions. Uh, Okay, this is pertaining to safety, actually. So what is the incidence of, of iatrogenic thromboembolic phenomena during the contrast DOE? Um, actually, uh, uh, contrast agents uh, uh, have a quite of uh, thrombolytic uh, capacity. So, okay. so I think they do not um, amplify a prothrombotic state. So yeah. you should not be in fear that there is a thrombus formed because of the injection of contrast agent. It is more the, on the contrary. Okay, great. So, um, okay, so there's another question here. Um, what is the, so there's lots of question about multipulse imaging. Uh, uh, in this, you know, in, uh, uh, where people are asking. So one of the question is, how do you actually do multiple imaging? I mean, I mean, what do you need to do on the machine? Yeah, um, we use uh, GE machines, and um, the, e the GE machines have, uh, if you if you have the contrast software package on board, mm -hmm. uh, there are actually two different. Um, uh, men, uh, setups or menus to choose, and uh, the multipulse technique is the is uh, named on the machine LVO uh, mm -hmm. setup. Uh, so That's we use an LVO yeah. setup, and this uh, in the name is included that we have a, a lot of penetration. If right. you use it for LVO with a TE probe, you should yeah. have a penetration, and penetration is necessary for TE studies because the tip of the left atrial appendage yes. may be up to 15 centimeters uh, away from the probe, and yes. you need penetration. Yes. So uh, if you have no special contrast program on your machine, mm. you have only harmonic imaging. But most of the machines uh, work by default with fundamental imaging yes. because of the heating of the probe. Mm. So you have to look, f uh, you have to change from fundamental to harmonic, mm. reduce the MI, mm. and look if uh, it works for you on your machine if you have no multipulse technique. Uh, so it is. So this general concept is true for all other machines, also, isn't it? You go from yeah. fundamental to harmonic, exactly. and uh, and and we have to find out from the vendor. How do you get to multipulse technique in each exactly. of this machine? And, ask, and they, and they the should have it. Yeah. They should have it. In fact, they must have it because it's really useful. Uh, to, you know, uh, in 10 percent of patients where we can't identify thrombus, this should be the technique of choice. So uh, let's move on. Um, so that's about multi. Quite a lot of questions on that. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, so there's another interesting question here that, okay, it's a very basic question. What is the mechanical index? Yeah, uh, the mechanical index is, uh, this is not an easy answer, really. Uh, it is displayed on every screen and it gives you an information about a potential risk if you change um, a setup. But actually, uh, it is a, uh, a measure for uh, the energy that uh, in the non-mechanical, uh, uh, the mechanical or uh, uh, energy that is transmitted to the tissue. And uh, in uh, cardiology uh, or echoes for uh, um, grown people, it doesn't matter. It's normally only uh, uh, to think about if you examine uh, uh, newborns or. Uh, uh, where where there is a risk uh, by ultrasound, mm. uh, by heating, mm. uh, or mechanical uh, damage of the tissue of the uh, newborn or unborn uh, child. So um, um, we use the mechanical index to to um, to to control our output energy. You you have a, a display by decibel or something like this. You mm -hmm. can use it as well, mm -hmm. but normally uh, everyone uses the mechanical index uh, as a measure of output power. But actually, it is not out, output power. But yes. we can use it uh, as a surrogate. As, as a so so essentially, I mean, in 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 very uh, simple term, mechanical index denotes the power of the machine, the energy that it delivers. Uh, uh, so the higher the mechanical index, the more energy it delivers, uh, 
and therefore, uh, if, if you're talking in terms of micro bubbles, higher mechanical index destroys the micro bubbles. The exactly. lower mechanical index allows it to reverberate or resonate, but not really destroy too much. And therefore, we go down to low mechanical index for contrast imaging uh, uh, assessment. Exactly. So uh, I think we are, uh, we've got more questions. So <laughs> let's see if we can answer one or two here. Uh, Well, this is <laughs> an interesting question. Which contrast do you prefer for the left atrial appendage thrombus study? Um, there is uh, no, uh, you can use every approved uh, contrast agent for this purpose. There is really no difference between different vendors. Uh, we use uh, since uh, 2008 Sonovu, but you can use every other product in the market. There is uh, really no advantage or disadvantage in other products. Right. So, so another question which is there, but um, uh, which also is an important to think about. Uh, you, you give boluses. Do you give, ever give infusion of a contrast for looking at left atrial appendage? Um, pumps? Actually, I think this is a really interesting idea. We have mm. a pump, mm. uh, but um, in the moment you decide to use a pump, uh, because uh, you are confronted with spontaneous echo contrast, you need about two minutes to prepare the pump mm. if you have a nurse which is quite trained. Yes. And this two minutes, uh, the patients may be suffered and cuffs. And uh, right. so if you want to avoid that the examination is prolonged too much, I, I haven't used the pump. Okay. I so never used the pump. Okay. But uh, it, should be have, it should have an advantage. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, with the pump, the only reason for using infusion is if you're actually looking at perfusion within that mass, perhaps that, that would be uh, useful. But I, I don't think that's a major issue. Yeah, and, and the diagnostic window is a yeah. little bit longer, I think. Yes. And this is simpler for the untrained. Yes. Uh, if we train, uh, if we train a, uh, a colleague, yes. then the pump may be uh, the better way yes. to help him. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so I think we are now uh, approaching the end of this webinar. And I would like to close the session by summarizing the key messages for you today in, uh, for use of contrast in clinical practice. In patients with non-valvular AF, the majority of thrombus is at the tip of the left atrial appendage. Use of echo contrast agents, one must use it when there is spontaneous echo contrast in the left atrial uh, appendage, if there are trabeculations and when the uh, Doppler velocities are low and when thrombus is suspected that you must use contrast, uh, use harmonic imaging, but actually use multipulse technique, uh, which is a specific contrast setting with a mechanical index from 0 point, uh, 0 0.07 to 0 0.2, about 0 0.1, with a focus position at the tip of the left atrial appendage. Record loops length of more than 40, 40 in patients with low filling velocity, like less than 20 centimeter per second to really identify the thrombus. Now, I must thank uh, Dr. Helfen for this wonderful presentation. The program is sponsored by BRACO in the form of an educational grant. You'll be able to watch the web, uh, webinar on demand on the ESC website. Thank you, everybody, and have a great evening. <laughs> <laughs>